Count Corla, and firstly I acknowledge I am taking this as the last Count Corla of the committee. Um, um, I just want to, I suppose, acknowledge the fact that the Cahirlach of this committee uh, today, un unfortunately and tragically, uh, is burying his brother, uh, John Nocton. Indeed, it's a sad time for the House, and not only uh, Deputy Nocton has suffered a bereavement, but I've just learned that uh, Minister Burke has suffered a, a bereavement in his family as well. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that and to acknowledge the, the great leadership that our Cahirlach, um, Dennis Nocton, has shown on this committee and in particular on this issue of energy poverty. Um, it, this is a quote that I've used often before in this house, but I'll use it again. It's from the, the science fiction writer, William Gibson. He said, the future is already here, just unevenly distributed. And, and the reason this sticks with me is because it's so self-evident around the issue of energy poverty and the, inner, uh, the issue of retrofitting. There are people who are already living in the energy future. They live in a, a highly rated energy efficient home. They might be in an A rated or a B rated home. Perhaps they've had enough money to retrofit. Perhaps they've, they've bought a new property recently. And so their energy bills are naturally lower. Mm -hmm. They might have been able to afford to put a solar array on top of the roof, maybe quite a significant one. And so they're generating their own electricity. I know many people who are in the fortunate situation of having positive energy bills. Not only are they using the electricity off of their roof, but they're generating a surplus. And that surplus is feeding back into the grid. They're being paid for that. An initiative led by this government, very welcome. And so they're actually making money on their electricity, particularly, let's say, in the summertime months or the, the four peak months for electricity generation. Some of these households are fortunate enough to have a, an EV in their driveway. And they can, in fact, drive on sunshine particularly during the, the summer months. In June, the sun might be shining, they'll choose to, to plug their car into their solar panels and they're driving for free. This is the energy future that we want all households to attain. We want all households to be able to live in warm, healthy, retrofitted houses where their energy consumption and therefore their energy bills are lower and where they can have avail of all of those benefits that comes along with that. Perhaps that is in terms of generating their own electricity and generating a small bit of income from that. Particularly the health benefits. The health benefits of living in one of these high performing homes are enormous. But that's not the reality. The future is already here but it's unevenly distributed. There are many people and very often it's the poorest in our society who are living in poorly insulated homes. They could be F or G rated homes. Very often it's older social housing stock. And in reality, it doesn't matter how many shovels of coal you put on the fire. Most of the heat is going up the chimney. Most of your money is going up in the chimney. Um, I can remember it from my own childhood, but thankfully it's not my experience now, but it's the experience of many households up and down this country where your face is warm and your back is cold. And once the fire goes out in the evening, you know, people who bank up the fire for the evening, very often older people. And once that fire goes out, be it at two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning, the temperature in the house drops like a stone and they wake up to a cold house in the morning. That is not a situation we want any of our people to be in. Energy poverty is a, po a complex issue affecting many households globally and is becoming an urgent concern here in Ireland. As we aim for a sustainable and greener future, it's vital that nobody is left struggling to meet their basic energy needs. High energy costs, low household incomes and en energy inefficient housing make life harder for many families. And the impact of energy poverty isn't just financial, as I mentioned. It also affects health. It also affects people's well-being. People should not have to worry as to whether they can boil the kettle or whether they can put the immersion on to have a bath. That shouldn't be part of the things that, that mount on to their mental well-being. Energy poverty has been an item of this committee's work between 2023 and 2024, mainly because of the ongoing rise in living costs. The committee began its public meetings in this context in May 2023 and concluded in February 2024. This report puts forward 41 recommendations spanning three key areas namely the retrofitting of homes in rural and urban areas, the suitability of the fuel allowance, and the impact of energy poverty on mental and physical health. 
In its scrutiny of energy poverty, the committee held meetings with officials from the Department of the Environment, Climate and Communication, the Department of Social Protection and the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage, and further with representatives from the Society of St Vincent de Paul, the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland, Energy Cloud, Irish Rural Link, Friends of the Earth and the Irish Cancer Society. The committee also invited written submissions from interested groups and individuals. And if I may say, it was the contributions for the Irish Cancer Society that stuck with me most of the sessions that we had. It was not an area I was expecting to be most affected. But when the night nurses told us of people who were in their deathbed, surrounded by their family who are wearing coats and overcoats and hats because the person dying either didn't, couldn't afford the energy costs or was ashamed to ask for help in terms of energy costs to be able to heat their home as they died in their own house. Uh, and to hear that personal testimony from the night nurses, that affected me very greatly. And there's a range of recommendations uh, within this report that, that deals with the issue of people who have received a terminal diagnosis and how the state, in my view, should be kinder to those people. Um, energy poverty in Ireland is multifaceted. In many cases, it's driven primarily by three underlying root causes. These are linked to high energy expenditure in proportion to household budget, low in levels of income, and low energy performance of buildings and appliances. Very often, poor people's energy bills are higher than wealthier persons. For the, for the reasons that I outlined. Households with higher energy needs, which include families with children, persons with disabilities and older persons, are also more susceptible to energy poverty and its effects, to put it in simple terms, those families spend more time at home. An older person will generally spend more time at home than a person who is out working and therefore will be more susceptible to the impact of energy poverty. It's imperative in the colder weeks and months of, these, of the year that these most vulnerable in our society have sufficient heat in their homes to stay healthy and well. And one thing that frustrates me about how we do, I suppose, our budgeting and how we do our business in this house is that siloed effect. I'm firmly of the belief that investment in the prevention of energy poverty, actually viewed across the totality of the budget, because of its positive impacts, particularly in our health expenditure, would represent extremely good value for money. The time won't allow me to go into the recommendations in full, but I do want to speak to a number of the points. I'll, I'll begin with recommendation number two. And in fact, there's a number of recommendations who deal, that deal with this particular issue. There's an issue around the rented sector, the private rented sector, and it's the split incentive. If we invest in retrofit, it's the tenant who will benefit. It's the tenant's bills that will fall. The landlord's bills won't fall. So what incentive is there for a landlord to invest in his rental property? I think we need both carrot and stick in this. We have a commitment in Housing for All to implement minimum energy efficiency standards within our rental stock. That's the stick. I also think we need to look very seriously at a carrot. You know, we have to say to our landlords, look, if you invest in this property, which is going to lead to better health outcomes, better energy outcomes for the people who live in your uh, properties, the state is going to help you with that. However that's designed, but I do think that there's an incentive, there's a clear issue around this specific area. Um, the committee recommends a review and update of the SEI's overall mandate to include a greater focus on supporting those most at risk of energy poverty. And we talk about a wraparound service here in this. Now the warmer home scheme is excellent. It's oversubscribed. We are putting more money into it, and that was, that was decided on in this budget. It's partially funded through the carbon tax, which is often vilified, but that, that revenue raised goes to very important places, including into the retrofit of uh, homes of people who are on lower incomes. And it's very, very important. We need to invest more in that for sure. But for people, perhaps, who do have the wherewithal financially to invest in retrofit, it's not easy. And undertaking a deep retrofit of your house, that, it isn't going to be easy anyway. You know, it's, it's a very significant building and home improvement. But to try and jump through the hoops in order to get the grants, 
to get the three quotes in and to understand the difference in why those why you why are the different prices and you have these tog values that are coming back to you and you're going how in god's name am i to be able to discern value for money between these things we need to support people in that we need to make the business of retrofitting our homes a lot easier we need to do that in terms of cost and there has been significant improvements under this government in terms of the reduction of uh, to zero of VAT on solar panels and the announcement recently in the budget of a similar move not a zero rating but a, a reduction in the VAT levels of heat pumps and that's going to put it financially into more people's reach and I think we need to make it easier again if I can't get my head around it as a deputy of the Green Party you know who's kind of full-time at this how can I expect a normal layperson to navigate the process I think we need to look at smart meters and we need to look at the the role of the Commissioner of Regulation of Utilities to the CRU in this again this is another area where I'm bamboozled when I look at my energy me energy usage first of all getting access to my smart meter usage is not as straightforward as it should be and then when I get that back it's very difficult for anybody to interpret that energy usage and say to any layperson and say okay there's a here's this range of plans what's going to represent my best value for money and in fact we know a lot of people who are on lower and fixed incomes they'll often actually go with a prepaid provider and there their unit energy costs are locked in they're not the best value unit energy costs but what if the CRU was mandated with making that and that smart meter information available to the consumer available to the consumer in a legible and comprehensible fashion and then making recommendations common sense recommendations either around the type of um, rate that you should be on or indeed how you could shift your own energy usage patterns to say the simple things like you know don't have the dryer on between five and seven that's the time it's going to cost you the most money trying to shift the energy usage that by the way has a big benefit to the grid if we do that so sort of movement issues around fuel allowance and, and this goes back to a general issue around social welfare rates we really need to be benchmarking this uh, we've had a huge and there has been movement under this government but there has been huge spike in energy costs and the, the expansion of the fuel allowance doesn't always keep pace with that I do want to speak to some of the and I'm just having a quick look through them here just in terms of the that end of life or the people with a terminal diagnosis uh, we have a number of recommendations in this regard the committee recommends the provision of automatic entitlement to the household benefits package fuel allowance payment and additional needs payment to people with life limiting diagnosis including children and to make that available without means testing we would use the existing definition here of someone who is diagnosed with a terminal illness with an estimated uh, 24 months or fewer to live as is used in the case of the medical um, uh, emergency medical cards and another thing that w was spoken about at the committee and I don't think is very well known is the solar PV scheme for med medically vulnerable homes so people who have that extra cost perhaps it is that they have medical equipment with their, within their homes perhaps it's just because of their their medical diagnosis they need to spend more time at homes there is a very good scheme available in terms of putting solar PV on that house to help lessen that but I'm not sure that the awareness is there it's certainly something I learned during the course of the committee I'm not going to have time to speak in detail to many more of the amendments I do want to mention just in particular energy cloud which the minister is probably aware they do excellent work around look we know renewable electricity is intermittent and there are times when the wind is blowing particularly during the middle of the night and we've no place to put that electricity we don't have the battery storage uh, as yet energy cloud have come up with a very good and very common sense solution whereby if we know that there's going to be extra uh, electricity generated people in low-income households get a text message to say we are going to heat your hot water tank this evening rather than waste that energy we're putting it into the water in low energy homes I think that's a really good usage but Minister to go back to that original quote the idea that the future is already here just unevenly distributed and to think about the commitment that we have under the sustainable development goals to reach the furthest behind first we need to redouble our efforts because there are people who are living in that energy future 
and that's great. It's good news for them. They had the wherewithal, both financially and, I suppose, intellectually, to navigate the hoops they needed to jump through. But we need to reach the people who are living in energy-poor homes, who are living less healthy lives as a result, and we need to redouble our efforts so that in this energy transition, those people who are furthest behind are reached and brought with us on this energy transition. And I want to join uh, with Deputy Cossie, and I'm sure with the House in expressing my deepest sympathies to the Cahirlook of the Community Deputy Dennis Stockton on the untimely passing of his brother John. Um, and our thoughts and our prayers are with the Nocton family uh, in these very dark days. Um, I want to thank the committee, the members, but also the Secretariat uh, for the work that they have done in preparing uh, this report. As Deputy O'Connor has said, the high cost of energy uh, has had a significant impact on the cost of living for many people, particularly that of the last number of years, which has been brought on by volatility in, in international markets. Government has introduced a suite of measures over that time to help households deal with the rising costs of electricity. In 2022, we saw the introduction of the Electricity Costs Emergency Measures Bill, which provided for one-off credit of €200 Euro to be applied to all domestic electricity accounts. This was in turn followed by two subsequent rounds of emergency credits in Budgets 23 and in 24. And together, these credits facilitated a transfer of €1,250 Euro to over 2.2 million households at a cost of approximately €2.75 billion. Euro. This is in addition to one-off increases to certain social welfare recipients, such as those in receipt of the fuel allowance, pensioners, working families, carers, those living with a disability, and those in receipt of child benefit. Inclusive of the cost of the universal energy credit and targeted groups across 2022, 2023, and 2024, the government provided 7.1 billion euro worth of supports in acknowledgement of the energy crisis and cost of living crisis, which is a direct result of the inflationary pressure of increased energy costs. However, further action was needed, and this is also why we introduced the largest social welfare package in the history of the state, providing 2.6 billion euro to assist households in budget 2025, and that will be discussed next week. Among the measures that are in place to assist people with the cost of energy to heat and to light homes are an electricity costs emergency benefit payment of €250, Euro, including that for an estimated 2.263 million domestic electricity accounts being paid in two instalments in 24 and in 25. €300 Euro cost of living lump sum payment to all households getting fuel allowance to be paid in November 24, meaning recipients will receive a total of €1,224 this year, including their fuel allowance payments and the associated lump sum. An increased means threshold for fuel allowance extended to those 66 and over for January 2025, meaning more people will qualify for this very important support. However, as Deputy Cossie has said, there are more longer term issues uh, in this report and deeper structural issues. And given that energy poverty is influenced not only by the cost of energy and of persons' income, but also by the energy efficiency of their home, I welcome the prominence and the Deputy Cossie and the Committee have given uh, to the issue of retrofitting. It is useful to make, uh, inform the House about the measures introduced by the Government. National Retrofan sits out how the Government is delivering on these retrofit targets. The National Plan is designed to address barriers, barriers to retrofit across four key pillars – to drive demand and activity, to finance and fund, to ensure we have supply chains, skills and standards in place, and governance of those standards. For each pillar, barriers were identified and time-bound policies were put in place along with measures and actions. The initiatives in the plan are also guided by a number of key principles, including ensuring fairness to all and supporting a just transition, embracing a universal approach which will cover all housing types and consumer segments, and designing customer-centric solutions to reduce the costs and complexity, making the process easier for those investing in retrofit. However, I do fully subscribe to Dr. Cossie's remarks in relation to the complexity in this space. 
The National Retrofit Plan is underpinned by a financial allocation of €8 billion Euro to 2030, €5 billion of which will be sourced from carbon tax revenue. This year, a total of €527 million Euro has been allocated to support retrofit across government. Of this amount, a record total of €300 million Euro will be spent on providing fully funded upgrades through SEAI's dedicated energy poverty schemes and local authority refits. I am happy to report that funding for these schemes will be increased further next year, with a €330 million Euro allocation for SEAI's dedicated energy poverty scheme and local authority retrofits. Concurrent retrofit plan is working, and that is clear from the increasing levels of delivery in recent years. Last year saw over 47,900 home energy upgrades supported by SEAI. Almost 5,900 of these homes were fully funded upgrades under the Warmer Home Scheme, with a further 730 approved housing, homes, um, housing body homes upgraded under other SEAI schemes. Separately, over 2,250 homes were upgraded under the Department of Housing funded Local Authority Energy Efficiency Programme. 2024 will be another year of record progress. To, end, to the end of September, 38,000 homes were upgraded, including 5,255 free upgrades under the Warmer Home Scheme. Local Authority output figures will be available at the end of the year. In relation to the Warmer Home Scheme, the Committee's report has made a number of recommendations to this scheme, which provides free energy upgrades for households at risk of energy poverty, as spoken about by Deputy Akahasi. Since February 2022, the scheme has put a particular focus on the worst performing properties by prioritising homes built and occupied before January 1993 and have a pre-works building energy rating on the EFRG. This has had the impact of significantly reducing waiting times for these homes, which are most in need of support. E, F and G rated homes now have an average delivery time of 17 months, a reduction of nine months compared to 2022. Better performing homes have an average delivery time of 20 months, a reduction of six months compared to 2022. The, the reductions in the average waiting times for both cohorts of homes have been achieved in part through the following actions. SEI has been allocated additional staff for the Warmer Home Scheme, active contract engagement and management to increase contractor output, and actions have been taken to address ongoing supply chain and inflationary processes. A record budget allocation of €208.8 million Euro was put in place for 2024, and a new €700 million Euro contractor panel has been put in place for the next four years, which has increased contractor capacity to 36. The Committee's report has noted the difficulties with upgrading older homes that are constructed using more traditional methods, and I suspect many of us have experienced those personally. Wall insulation is not recommended under any of SAI's residential energy efficiency schemes on buildings built before 1940, which are constructed in stone, single-leaf masonry or composite wall construction. This is because standard or modern retrofit solutions are often not suitable for these buildings as they can lead to adverse and unintended consequences such as damp and mould and increasingly affecting the health and well-being of people living there. However, we must recognise that these homes need to be upgraded and significant work has taken place to develop a pilot scheme to upgrade traditional buildings. Works taking place under the pilot will be guided by the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage's guidance on energy efficiency in traditional buildings. The pilot will commence later this year and an interim evaluation will be prepared in Q2 2025 to inform any future development that is required. All home upgrades will be completed by Q4 2025 with a final report on the pilot findings to be delivered by the end of January 2026. In the meantime, SEAI is actively reviewing homes applying under the Warmer Home Schemes to ensure that shallow measures are maximised where they are not suitable for deeper upgrades. These measures will include heating system controls, LEDs and lagging jackets as a way of example. It is important, though, Ken Culler, to note that in practice SEAI is finding in many cases such measures are already in place, so accordingly this initiative will be kept under review. Many households who need support do not, are not eligible for the Warmer Home Scheme. 
and that is why a further range of supports are available through SEAI, including a special enhanced grant rate for attic and cavity wall installation schemes that support a step-by-step -step approach, which will allow homeowners to retrofit their home in stages over a number of years, and a new home energy upgrade loan scheme, uh, which will help reduce the financial challenges for many homeowners and will play a crucial role in helping homeowners to invest in energy efficiency. Before I conclude, I, concur, I want to thank uh, Deputy Conley for his considered uh, overview of the report, of the report, and in particular his light on the submission of the Irish Cancer Society. That is not a position anyone wants any family or any loved one to be in uh, as they approach end of life, and that's something I will draw uh, my colleagues' uh, attention to. This government is committed to providing practical supports for those experiencing energy poverty, for those who want to upgrade the efficiencies. Uh, of their home, and I think we've shown during the course of our term in office uh, exceptional commitment in this space. Uh, Deputy Darren O'Rourke. Uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, Karen Corla, and uh, I too want to extend my deepest sympathies to Deputy Nocton on the loss of his brother. Um, we sit on, I, I don't sit on this committee, um, but uh, um, Deputy Nocton chairs the Friends of Science Group and the Oireachtas, and you know, uh, um, my, my deepest uh, sympathies to, to him and his family at this difficult time. Um, I want to commend the, the committee for their work in relation to this. Uh, uh, I should give apologies on behalf of Deputy Donegal Lera, who was to take this, but is, is uh, unavailable at, the, at this time. Um, it's a really important topic. Um, uh, I, I watched a number of the hearings and discussed with Deputy O'Leary and uh, 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 some of the, the, the issues at the time. Um, I'm reminded, and Deputy O'Kosig mentioned energy cloud. Um, they, they tag me and a number of others, I'm sure, in, in their, their online posts and in the last 24 hours the, the same and said that 10.28 million euros worth of energy was was wasted last week um, um, due to constraints on the, on the grid. That's the equivalent of 25,718 megawatt hours of power and uh, enough to heat uh, 8.5 million hot water tanks. You know, so so their their initiative uh, is really helping. Uh, people uh, at, at risk and living in energy poverty. It's a really practical uh, measure, uh, but it's, it's very clear that there is uh, significant uh, greater potential for, for it. Um, on the area of the the National Retrofitting Plan, and look, we have been at loggerheads with government in, in relation uh, to it, and our central argument is that there isn't enough of a focus in the National Retrofitting Plan on uh, 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 energy poverty metrics, of you know, lifting people out of energy poverty. That specifically as a, as a, as a measure, um, I've had lots of over and back with, with Minister Ryan in relation to this. We, we recognise um, the investment in it, although Sinn Féin do the same and more, uh, we recognise the amount of work that is, that is underway, um, but for us there are fundamental gaps there in terms of, of the, the equity piece and the numbers that have been outlined, um, you know, we can pick at them, but r really what I'm, I'm hoping to do, do here is, is just, just, just set out. Like, my colleague uh, Deputy Tommy Gould was here yesterday when we had a debate in, in relation to something or other and, and gave the example of the social housing retrofitting programme and said in either the city or county of Cork, based on the current progress, it would take 200 years to retrofit the, 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 the homes in, in that city or county. Um, and it's similar elsewhere. We just, we just know that the, the, the programme is built in such a way that it's, it's, it's only going to hit a fraction of, of those houses out to 2030. Similarly, and I welcome the fact that there is a, a pilot to report in Q2 uh, next year, um, but we have, been, we have been proposing in Sinn Féin a targeted scheme for people in solid fuel homes, um, and I think that's something that that, uh, um, that, that others and uh, 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 have have echoed. You know, Social Justice Ireland, Friends of the Earth, and and, and others, um, and similarly the potential of, of solar PV. Um, I think in all of this, like there needs to be the question asked in terms of a huge state investment. Um, there's a huge amount of work being done. There's industries scaling up 
and you know, uh, matching that ambition for, from government. But we have to ask the question, who is benefiting from it? We want everybody to benefit from it, but no more the, 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 the inverse care law, and we met in the AV room earlier with, with people uh, making the case for a DESH plus programme. Um, and their argument was that we represent the most vulnerable communities. Um, everybody's getting free school meals, everybody's getting um, these measures. We need a, a, a specific targeted measure to, that recognises the 50 or 100 schools. Um, the inverse care law, you know, those people who need this stuff the most should be, should be getting the most of it. Um, uh, 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 another point I will make, uh, which, which the Minister has made, and again it's a, it's a bone of contention between, between government and, and ourselves and opposition, is the issue in relation to carbon tax. Um, you know, we argue that you know, we, can, we can match government spend in relation to uh, climate action, but we raise the money in a different way. Um, government make a different point and, and they point towards the year-on-year -year, uh, investment and the, the timeline out to 2030. I will make the point um, that the Controller and Auditor General's report from 2023 said that f at least 40% or in around 40% of the so-called ring-fenced money wasn't properly accounted for. So the question of, you know, argument aside, if the government are saying we're ring-fencing ring this for fuel poverty, uh, to address fuel poverty, to address um, through social welfare schemes, um, through the retrofitting plan and through agricultural schemes, well then that money needs to be accounted for and clearly from the controller and auditor general he says th those systems aren't in place. Um, so, 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 so that needs to be addressed and if there was a change of government there might be an entirely different approach in relation to carbon tax but shin scale Ella. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, I think um, the, the, the other thing I will say, the final thing I will say, is just in terms of the energy poverty strategy. Um, we had for a long, ter long time during the term of this government argued that we needed to get it back, uh, uh, you know, to get the, the, the strategy updated. I think it needs to be a, um, a priority focus. It needs to be central to, to uh, everything we do. When, when we talk to the, the stakeholders, in, stakeholders in relation to it, they talk about the difficulty in terms of the quality of data. So let's get you know those data sets. Um, let's get them talking to each other, and let let's get the, the 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 researchers within government agencies, whether it be the SAI or the likes of the ESRI. Let's get them using that to best effect, so we can identify those people most in need, those areas most in need, and respond to them in, in, in kind. And the final thing, final, final thing I will say is in relation to the cost of electricity, the potential role for communities and the need for, you know, um, uh, aggressive and progressive reforms of the energy sector in this area to drive down the cost of, of energy. It's not enough to come at the end of every year. Of course, it's welcome to, 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 to give money to people through energy credits, but that's not sustainable and we need those fundamental reforms. But to commend the, the report and all the work that, that went into it. Go on. Back to Minister and to Deputy. Do you want to have a second go at it? Or do you want to share your time? Maybe there, there's ten minutes each available to you. Well, you're the proposer, so you're you're first up. Right. Um, well, thank you, Ken Corla, and thank you, Minister, and, and thank you to Deputy O'Rourke for their contributions on it. I suppose I won't go back into the detail of the report, but I'll attempt maybe to to address some of the commentary that was made. I I think here. We have to distinguish between what we're trying to do in the short term, the medium term and the long term. So in the long term, the goal uh, is the retrofit of all of our housing stocks so that people live in this energy future that I've been talking about. Now, Deputy O'Rourke referenced that 200 years time frame, and I think we'd accept that A, 200 years is, would be in no way acceptable, but we don't actually believe that that's how long it's going to take. We have... And over the course of this government, we have created an industry. I, I see very interesting things happening down in uh, Waterford-Wexford ETB, where 
trained people, people who are already craftsmen, are being called in for short supplemental courses. And that means they are now ready for an economy of the future. And what we have done in terms of setting out 2030 targets and that 8 billion out to 2030 is we've created certainty for an industry. And we said there are jobs in this, there will be employment in this into the future. And more and more tradespeople are moving into it. And that's why we're seeing such significant movement in terms of the number of homes retrofitted each year. And I think that goes to one of the other concerns that Deputy O'Rourke raised around where we, where we target the resource. It was important that we built the sector, we gave a very clear signal to the sector, and that we involved people's, people with their own private resource to be able to come into it as well. So that you're building the industry not just on government money alone, but also the, basically the people who could afford to make the transition. And you're saying, OK, make that investment in your property. It's a great long-term investment. It's going to lower your energy bills. It's going to you know, increase the value of your property. And to bring that private money out to play. I think that's important. I do share the equity concerns. But I don't think that just a government investment alone would have been enough to unlock the industry. So I don't think there'd be anybody on the government side of the house who would try to prefer pretend that the natural, national retrofit scheme is perfect as it is right now. But there's been a huge amount of movement over the course of the lifetime of this government. And for sure, like any uh, programme for investment, we need to refine that as we move on. And I absolutely agree with the idea that we need to be focusing on those people who are furthest behind first. And I know that the Minister outlined some of the progress in terms of targeting those E, F and G rated homes. I mean, 17 months is still far longer than I would like for that waiting time, but it is a significant improvement over a relatively short period of time. That's the long-term goal. That's where we want to get to. In the short term, what this government has done is cash transfers. That's the simple, quickest thing we could do. That's where the energy credits come from. There's both focused energy credits and through the, in, through the improvements that have been made, in particular to fuel allowance, some of those lump sums that have been paid out to people who are on social protection payments, and then there's the more generalised energy credits. I think some of the criticism of that generalised energy credit is warranted. It's not targeted, it's a significant expenditure of money, but what it does is it makes sure that those people who are maybe aren't as readily identifiable through the social protection system but who absolutely need the support that they're reached. And I suppose there was a decision to be made whether you accidentally gave some money to people who maybe didn't need it on the one hand, or on the other hand, you missed out on a huge cohort who are struggling to, to meet their energy costs. And I think on balance, while I might share some of the reservations that have been outlined in this previously, I think we've got that balance right. And it was important that the state did help people, particularly in a time of a huge spike in terms of energy. But what are we going to do in that medium term? How can we reach people, and I don't for a minute accept that it's going to be 200 years before they begin to feel the benefit of the energy transition. But maybe it's not in the next five years, or maybe it's not in the t next 10 years. Or indeed for older people. Saying to somebody who's in the later years of their life, my own father turned 81, uh, just last week, and he was talking about installation of solar. He's mad to install a bit of solar, but he was kind of realistic about, you know, the payback period that you're going to get on. So he was talking about, well, you know, we'll put solar up in the house, and sure, maybe you'll get the benefit of it in the longer term. But if you're an older person, to say, oh, you should engage in a deep energy retrofit, if I'm in my 80s, do I want to move out of my house while we're doing a deep retrofit? You know, or if I'm in uh, it's social housing stock, and I don't have that wherewithal to pull the trigger on this investment myself. Is there a way that we can reach these people in the medium term that's going to give them some of the benefit of this energy transition? And I do, and Energy Cloud are, are well able to bang their own drum. They're, they're very good at it, and I get tagged into the same posts as Deputy or Work does. But it is worth pointing out again. That is something that can be delivered in a relatively short term that really does give people who need it a benefit of this energy transition. And there's other things that we can do in this space. Um, the Green Party in Austria, one of their uh, initiatives, has been around white goods, 
energy efficient white goods in uh, people, on lower, uh, people in lower income homes. Which is to say, if you're replacing your washing machine, and there's already grants uh, through the social welfare system for this type of thing, if you're replacing the washing system, instead of getting the poorly energy rated one, get the better energy rated one. That gives somebody a dividend from this energy transition. I think that's very important. What I, we were speaking about in terms of the Commission of Regulation of Utilities and the interpretation of smart meter data. That is something that can be done that has all sorts of benefits. If we take somebody in a household that's suffering from energy poverty, we make common sense recommendations to them in terms of the, the energy plan that they're availing of that's going to save the money, and we make recommendations to them in terms of shifting their usage of energy, that has a wider implication, not just for the person living in that household, but how we integrate renewables onto the grid. This is good common sense for many, many people. And I think it's something that we have to look at. You know, that short-term intervention in terms of cash transfer, that's going to stay there in terms of the fuel allowance. We do need to look at how we, we treat the fuel allowance into the future. The longer-term vision is to get everybody into those energy-efficient, uh, retrofitted, healthier, warmer, cheaper homes with a dividend for the environment. Are there things we can do in the medium term? Are there common sense interventions that we can use to reach people who are furthest behind and say, look, this energy transition isn't just for the wealthy. This energy transition is something that benefits you, your community, and the wider environment. And that's something we need, really need to work on. The, the criticism of carbon tax, let's be honest, let's be truthful, any tax on consumption can be criticised for being retro, uh, regressive because it's going to have a greater impact on those people with lower levels of disposable income. There's another way of reading the carbon tax, which is to say the top decile use approximately eight times more carbon than the bottom decile. So people who are on the highest incomes are, are going to pay, roughly speaking, eight times the amount of carbon tax, and it's the usage that it's criti is critical. And the criticism that I would accept from Deputy O'Rourke is that 40% of the ring fence money through the raising of the carbon taxes and the CNAG report. I'm also a member of the Public Accounts Committee. If we are saying to people that there's a price signal around the use of carbon, and I believe that there needs to be a price signal in terms of the usage of carbon, we have to make sure that it's been spent. And we have to be sure that it's been spent in a way that reaches the people who most need this help. That we really are making sure the people furthest behind are the ones who are being reached more. So I think this has been a useful debate. I, this committee and um, Deputy O'Rourke mentioned Deputy O'Leary and Deputy Donnelly uh, from Sinn Féin sit in that. It's actually a very collegiate, and very cross-party committee. And of course, uh, the chairmanship of Deputy Nocton is critical in that as well. And really, we were trying to do good with this report. There was no grandstanding. There was no showboating. The members of the committee really worked well together to formulate what I think are good quality recommendations. And what I'm hoping is that the Minister will be able to bring this back to Minister Ryan to say again, look, there are recommendations here that can be actioned in the short term, in the medium term, in the long term, to make sure that more of our people begin to live in that energy future that is critical, both for the well-being of our people, but for the well-being of our planet, and that we can really begin to unlock a triple benefit here, whereby we benefit people, we benefit our own economy here locally, here nationally, and we have that positive impact in the wider world as well. So uh, I thank the Count Corla for the, the time to have this debate this evening, and I really hope that this is not a report set to sit on a shelf, but some of the, the recommendations can be actioned. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Kasich. Minister? Uh, thank you, Concordor. I, I thank Deputy Kasich again and indeed Deputy work for their contribution. I, I think it's important just to reflect uh, on, on Deputy O'Rourke's comments. The retrofit plan is ambitious and we have a very serious ambition here. It's also realistic. Um, you know, we're, we're definitely, I absolutely agree with Deputy Kasich. We're not signing up to 220 years, um, but we've been building capacity. Uh, I've referred to in my opening remarks the extra companies that are involved. Uh, I think we all know, the three, the four, four of us know, our local ETBs are 
investing considerably in local apprenticeships and in local training in this space. And as we feed the demand, the demand has to be met by skills, and those skills have to be provided. Uh, and again, to reiterate, uh, an €8 billion Euro investment uh, between now and 2030, uh, 530, uh, 527 million this year, last year, you know, 2,250 homes under the Local Authority Energy Efficiency Scheme. One of the recommendations uh, of the report that has been actioned uh, on a pilot basis was that um, a local authority and privately owned homes in the same estate or in the same area would be done through clustering. That makes complete sense. Um, it's kind of mad that you have to recommend it in an Oireachtas Committee report, but welcome, welcome to this country. And that's starting um, with a pilot project underway in Fingal. Uh, and that will feed a lot of work and certainly reach the targets uh, an awful lot quicker. There was also uh, recommendations in the report around the challenges around the private rental sector. Uh, and that's been found right across the world. So we are working under the retrofit plan to encourage landlords to invest in upgrading their properties, which includes access to the Home Energy Upgrade Loan Scheme, which includes a dedicated tax incentives for small landlords uh, to uh, undertake retrofitting works while the tenant is in situ. Uh, and finally, I'm delighted that an energy poverty action plan is currently being prepared, which um, followed a public consultation process earlier this year, and that revised plan will be published later this year, and I will be confident and hopeful that it will capture many of the recommendations of this report. So, Karen Corder, thank you to you for allowing time for this to be discussed this evening. Karen Morgan. Thank you, Minister, and thanks to all three of you for contributing. As someone who at the Business Committee has to manage competing demands for additional time uh, to talk on important matters, I have to say it is profoundly disappointing to come in here tonight to have a topic of enormous importance before us. And Apart from yourself as Laska Herlick and the Minister, that we have only one deputy, one other deputy present. Um, we could do it looking into our own hearts and seeing how well we are fulfilling our remit as far as energy poverty is concerned. But 